Kay and Lane begin this voyage in the Hauraki Gulf. They'll sail around and explore some of the islands of the Gulf, which are all within close proximity to each other, yet are so very different. Over on the Coromandel Peninsula, they'll take a hike up into the hills to visit an old Kauri dam. Then, back on the mainland, they'll sail far up an estuary to see where the European immigrants first settled. New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, with a population of 1.5 million, lies on the Waitemata Harbour in the southwestern corner of the Hauraki Gulf. Within this protected cruising ground of over 1,200 square nautical miles lie numerous islands and hundreds of beautiful anchorages, all within a day's sail from anywhere in the region. This region has nine marinas, totalling nearly 5,000 berths and the facilities are really excellent. Auckland has been called the city of sails, as there are more boats per capita here than anywhere else in the world. It was a beautiful day that we chose to leave Auckland to sail to Waiheke Island, our first island stopover. We enjoyed a great sail past the volcanic island of Rangitoto, which is the familiar symbol of the Hauraki Gulf. The island of Waiheke, with a population of 8,000, is just 13 miles from downtown Auckland. Many of the island's residents commute daily to the city to work. Just a 35-minute ferry trip allows them to return each evening to the peaceful island lifestyle. Some excellent wines are produced on the island and there are several superb venues, like here at Mudbrook Cafe, where you can book in for a special occasion or simply take a coffee while enjoying the magnificent setting. Oni Roa is the main town overlooking the beach on the northern side of the island. have made Waiheke their home, and you can find them at work right in the middle of town. There's some sculptures there. They're not, they're not blocks, but you can hang them in places like in trees. And... While young mums are getting back into shape on the beach, others are enjoying one of the many cafes up in town. Although it's midsummer here in New Zealand, it's Christmas Eve. So we're off to a quieter anchorage where we have planned to meet up with family and friends for a Christmas party. Well, the party's over, and it's time to weigh anchor and head to the Coromandel Peninsula and Great Barrier Island which help form a protective eastern boundary to the Hauraki Gulf. We'll also take a detour over to the beautiful Mercury Islands. The range of hills of the Coromandel Peninsula offers protection from the wind and sea to many protected anchorages on the western coastline. They also trap a lot of rain that comes in from the northeast. Before the arrival of the Europeans, much of New Zealand was covered in dense bush and massive forests of kauri. These trees grew tall and straight and the whalers were the first to load their ships with this wood for spars. 
Other parts of the world had been stripped of their trees and shipwrights were searching for other sources of good timber. Along with the quantity of wood available, New Zealand also had plenty of protected harbours to establish shipyards. So by the early 1800s, a huge shipbuilding industry had begun here. On Great Barrier Island and Coromandel, the loggers had to find ways to get the timber down the steep and rugged terrain to the ships waiting in the harbours below. They built huge wooden driving dams high up into the hills, some measuring 14 metres high by 40 metres wide. Only when as many logs as possible lay piled in the dry creek beds did they fill the pools above the dams. When tripped, the bursting floodgates created an avalanche, sending logs into the valley below. It's estimated about 3,000 of these dams were built in this area during the 50 years of intensive logging. The remains of only a couple of these dams exist today, and trampers can enjoy some wonderful walking tracks up to these historic places. In just over 100 years, the mainland and most of the outlying islands around the northern part of New Zealand had been stripped of their forests. Once the land was cleared, heavy rainfalls washed silt and soil down into harbours and estuaries throughout Northland. This has had a devastating and permanent effect on many of the once deep harbours, as they are no longer navigable by any deep drafted vessels. Four miles east of Coromandel Peninsula is Great Mercury Island. Farmland has replaced the Kauri forests that once grew here, and boaties come to enjoy its many spectacular anchorages. Lieutenant James Cook, later to become captain, stopped here during his first visit to New Zealand on the Endeavour in November 1769. He came to this bay specifically to observe the transit of Mercury. He wrote, If we should be fortunate to obtain this observation, the longitude of this place and country will thereby be very accurately determined. From here you can look across Mercury Bay to where Cook anchored and set up an observation point at a place known as Cook's Beach. He did succeed, and he went on to claim possession of New Zealand in the name of King George III. When we got back down to the beach, we saw that a pod of bottlenose dolphins had come in really close to shore. Islands are renowned for their abundant scallops, so Lane went diving with friends in about 10 metres of water. They found their quota in no time, so we had plenty to share with friends to celebrate the beginning of another year. Mm. Oh, oh boy! We were having a great time sailing Mai Tai in the steady 25 knots of breeze. And it didn't take us long to sail the 30 nautical miles to Great Barrier Island. This is New Zealand's fourth largest island, after the North, South and Stewart Islands. Great Barrier Island is 40 miles long, 10 miles wide and just 60 nautical miles from downtown Auckland. It is often not until late in the afternoon that you arrive at Great Barrier Island if you've sailed over from anywhere near Auckland. This narrow passage opens into an immense harbour with dozens of bays and coves to choose from to drop your anchor. This was our favourite anchorage in Kiwi Riki Bay, tucked in behind these two islands, looking back out towards the narrow entrance.
Last year, in preparation for this voyage down to the southern regions of New Zealand, the addition of this hard dodger with the full canvas enclosure has added a whole new room to Mai Tai. With our two 75 watt solar panels and wind generator, we are able to produce sufficient power to allow us to be completely autonomous. We also have a water maker on board, but on wash day, I prefer to take the dinghy over to a nearby bay where some cruisers have run a water hose down from a stream to some concrete wash basins, installed an old hand wringer to create the ideal cruiser's laundry. Port Fitzroy is the commercial hub of Fitzroy Harbour, where you can find all the necessities for this cruising life. The road from here connects with the two airports, to Trifena for the ferry that has a regular service to and from Auckland, or you can simply catch a bus to tour the whole island. The harbours on this western bush-clad side of the island offer excellent, well-protected anchorages. But on the east coast, the long stretches of white sandy beaches are open to the sea, so it's wise to only come over here during settled weather and leave plenty of time to explore this beautiful coastline. Sailing back towards the mainland, Kay and Lane will stop off at Kauau Island, 30 nautical miles from here. Access to Kauau is still possible only by boat, as there are no roads on the island. Copper was mined here briefly, but when the operation closed down, the remains of the mine and an old rundown manager's house were left behind. In 1862, the Governor of New Zealand, Sir George Grey, bought the island and transformed the old house into his dream residence. He imported exotic plants and animals including zebras, emus and monkeys. All have died out except the wallabies and the peacocks, which still roam freely about the park-like grounds. Over on the mainland, large, shallow, mangrove-lined waterways reach far inland. In the mid-1800s, it was here that many of the European immigrants arriving off the ships from Britain were left to start their new life in this new land. At that time, the local government was giving away large parcels of this wasteland to encourage new settlers to New Zealand. The rivers were tidal and muddy and the families had the incredibly difficult task of finding some way to turn this land, so thick with dense bush and huge kauri forests, into useful farmland. What a shock they must have got when they got off the ship and first set eyes on this beautiful yet unforgiving land. As the kauri trees were highly valued for their timber, the first industries to be established were sawmills and shipyards. There were no roads, so boats were the only form of transport for many years. Many were wrecked along the coast, and some of the larger ones have been restored to be admired by future generations. The Rangi River was once busy with these scars, loaded with timber and later cement, setting off to the port of Auckland, 30 miles away. This river is shallow and very tidal, so only navigable at high tide, which happened to be at 6 o'clock on a very still morning the day we came up here to haul out Mai Tai at a boatyard right next door to the old cement works. The beautiful setting made the months of hard work completely sanding and repainting Mai Tai somewhat more pleasant. The Portland Cement Works, built in 1872, were the first in the Southern Hemisphere 
and at one time employed 180 men. Among them, my own grandfather, who worked here as an industrial chemist. Pleasure yachts have now taken the place of the old scows that would line up here, loading their cargo of cement to be taken to Auckland for export. At high tide, small boats can sail right up to the township of Walkworth, which grew up as a result of all this industry and has since become a thriving centre for agriculture, arts and supports the nearby Matakana region. This land that was so painstakingly cleared last century is still being farmed today. Before leaving the Hauraki Gulf, Kay and Lane are going to call in at Goat Island, a small island close to shore, surrounded by New Zealand's first marine reserve. On the bank opposite is the Lee Marine Research Centre, which is a part of the University of Auckland, established here in the early 1970s. They've arranged to meet with the director of the laboratory, Professor John Montgomery, to talk about marine reserves and some of the research they're doing. Lee was established as one of the first legally constituted no-take marine reserves anywhere in the world. And now there are, um, say, 31-odd marine reserves in different locations around New Zealand. The reason that the laboratory was set up here is that it's just at the outer end of the Hauraki Gulf, which goes into Auckland Harbour. So we're only an hour out from a, a major city centre, and yet we've got pristine water um, conditions here open ocean um, impinging on um, a pristine coastline. The purposes of the marine reserves have become a major um, community resource and a, a place that people like to visit simply because of the populations of fish in the area and now. So we actually get 300,000 visitors to the beach per year to come and kayak and snorkel and scuba dive from the beach itself. So that alone is, uh, is really a major justification for the marine reserve. The reserve's been a remarkable success in terms of the regeneration of numbers of charismatic animals in the reserve space itself. That's in sort of intuitive feel. It's certainly been backed up by the research that's been done at the laboratory. So snapper numbers have recovered dramatically. Uh, rock lobster numbers have recovered dramatically. So one, one of the research programs we've got quite active at the moment is an area of uh, underwater acoustics. For instance, um, both here in a temperate reef, but also in coral reefs, most of the animals spawn their progeny off the reef. They spend time in the plankton feeding, and then to complete their life cycle, they have to return to the reef. And it turns out that sound is, uh, is a very likely cue to enable them to do that. So in, we've done some of this work up at the Great Barrier Reef, and we've found that if you put out artificial reef patches of dead coral, and you look at the settlement of animals into those patches, that you can effectively double the recruitment of um, larval fish into those reefs by the addition of reef sound. So in effect, uh, you can show that the animals are tracking that sound back to the reef again. In some of the recent work we've been doing, at least in temperate areas like here at Lee, the sound is being largely generated by snapping shrimp and sea urchins. Actually, people don't think of, think of sea urchins as creating sound, but their feeding activity and the way their shell resonates at particular frequencies means that they're quite a potent source of um, natural biological sound. Um, and there's a lot of interesting structure as well. There, there are dawn and dusk choruses, a bit like there are birds in the forest. So sea urchins and snapping shrimps um, on summer new moons, after the sun's gone down, there's a big chorus of activity there, uh, which actually coincides with the time when a lot of animals are settling on the reef. Situated just 12 miles off the Northland coast are the Poor Knights Islands, another one of New Zealand's 31 marine reserves. The subtropical current that passes through the huge kelp forests and giant caves enables a unique range of fish species to live here. Kay and Lane continue their voyage northwards, towards Northland and the Bay of Islands, where they'll spend time exploring and take a look at some of the colourful historic events that took place there.